And my purpose is to share with you some perspectives and reflections on, on the theme, which is what it means to claim full citizenship and self-determination in these times that we're in. Not only our movement, but in our allied movements and in this, this era that we, very conflicted era that we find ourselves in. And the challenges that we, we must face in doing so and, and ways in which individualized funding and personalized supports can help deliver on those claims for full citizenship. At the outset, though, I want to make clear the vantage point from which I'm speaking today. Um, gathered at this conference are people with disabilities who have accessed uh, individualized funding and personalized support, and their families who are passionate advocates for it. We have policymakers and thinkers from across Canada and around the world. We have researchers, we have senior who are evaluating this work um, and these initiatives. We have senior administrators who are designing individual policy and program frameworks for individualized funding schemes. Um, we have a range of family-based advocacy organizations and self-advocacy groups. Uh, and, and across this group, we've got many who are working on, on policy implementation, uh, evaluation, and others, most importantly, raising their voices for a right to self-determination and full citizenship. Into this mix, though, I, I want to speak from the perspective of our movement for inclusion and community living, for whom this issue is so fundamental for whom the issue of full citizenship is so fundamental. And from the perspective, though not certainly on behalf of the many provincial and territorial members of our, of our association and local members and allied uh, advocacy organizations for, for community living and, and inclusion. I think our job here over the next few days is to make very clear what our claim to citizenship and full citizenship is all about, what it means, so that as you go forward to design policy and programs and implement systems, you do that on the basis of a clear understanding of what this claim is and why it's so important, why it's so fundamental to us as a movement, our claim for full citizenship for people with intellectual disabilities and other disabilities and other marginalized groups more generally. Because the opening theme I think we heard very much this morning is that we need to do this in solidarity with others if we're gonna, if we're gonna intervene in a way that um, is gonna have the impact we're after. For, for many of us, the call for full citizenship has been the lifeblood of our movement begun in the 1940s and 50s by grandparents and parents of children with intellectual disabilities, we started asking, why is it that our tax dollars are being spent to educate some, but not all of our, all of our kids and our grandchildren? From the, from the very outset of our movement, then, we were casting our claims in citizenship terms. We understood that publicly funded education was a basic right of citizenship in Canada. So how could it be that there was a whole group that by the rules and uh, design of education systems and the criteria left a whole, whole group out? Well, as we learned, it was for systemic reasons. You define criteria in certain ways that include some who meet the criterion of educable in that case, and it designs out others who don't meet that term. So the more we advocated for full citizenship on the basis of equal respect and dignity, the more we began to see just how systemic and deep those exclusions were for the people we advocated for, with and for, how deeply it was written into the very fabric of law and policy and the ruling of our daily lives. When when we began to think and look more, more deeply at, at this, we began to see that while internationally recognized human rights, the rules of membership and citizenship, 
as they, as they get written. This is a tension that proceeds as we seek to implement them in, in actual jurisdictions. And this tension between the universal recognition of human rights and the actual framework by which uh, those claims are made practical in actual jurisdictions has become only more acute with the development of human rights treaties in the last 60 to 70 years since the Universal Declaration in 1948. And of course, with the, the development of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. In that period, undoubtedly, there's been a growing recognition of, hum, of universal human rights at, at, an, at an international level, and in particular with prohibitions against discrimination on the basis of, of disability. However, that's happening at exactly the same time that we're seeing widening gaps in access to needed support for people. As we look at people with disabilities, as older persons, we're seeing a growth in international commitments and obligations to fulfill these rights of citizenship, but it's the, the, the conditions for making it real in our own lives, in our communities, are, are disappearing under our very feet. And with the demographics of our aging population, this gap is only going to grow wider. And it's the direct result of governments not investing enough, despite having ratified all those international treaties, to secure those rights in people's lives, not investing enough to close that gap, to make those citizenship rights real. By 2020, it's estimated that the demand for disability-related personal assistance will outstrip the demand for law enforcement officers, teachers, educators, or healthcare workers. And we don't, it seems to me, so by 2020, the demand for personal support assistance to meet disability-related needs will outstrip the demand for law enforcement, healthcare workers, teachers, or, or teachers and educators. I, and I'd say that's the case in all countries, except possibly Australia, as we're going to learn today, as we learn and, and over these next few days about the, the Australian National Disability Insurance Scheme. As a movement, we're going to be watching closely and listening carefully and engaging in those discussions because we'll be bringing to our understanding of that plan the human rights norms that we fought for in Article 19 of the UN Convention to ensure people have the access to the supports that they need to live independently in the community. Will that scheme and with, will other schemes that are seeking to realize uh, 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 similar policy goals fulfill and deliver on those commitments, those obligations that our, our governments have, have ratified? But this, and I, this tension, though, is one that I expect will go on. Governments often introduce and implement these rich programs, and as they go on, tighten the criteria, define inclusion and exclusion a little more tightly, and before long we see that the program itself doesn't fulfill the norms that it's set out to in the first place. This, this tension between universal recognition of human rights on the one hand, and on the other, exclusionary criteria of, of membership that, that gets instituted in the implementation of those plans to realize rights has also become more acute for, for other marginalized groups. For example, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees estimated in June of this year uh, 59.5 million refugees and displaced persons worldwide. So we're seeing social and economic dis disruption as a result of, of, of conflict and, and disasters on a scale that will ex likely exceed this year the 60 million refugees in Europe between the first and the end of the Second World War. And we're seeing this come home with a clarity now and an impact uh, probably never before witnessed with the Syrian refugee crisis. And those images, I think, have been emblazoned on all of our memories in the last couple of months. 
But what's the link here? So why would I jump to the Syrian refugee crisis? How does this inform what we need to be doing here the next couple of days? I think it does inform us, and I want to lay out how, because at the core of the refugee crisis, whether we're talking the Second World War or the crisis we face today, are questions about the nature of citizenship and about the conditions of truly belonging in community. And Hannah Arendt, one of the great political thinkers of the, the 20th century and theorists, explores this question about the conditions of truly belonging in an era of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that meant, is meant to include us all in, in her study on, that published in 1951, The Origins of Totalitarianism, or it was, when it was published in the UK at first, The Burden, the burden of our times. She herself had become stateless, a Jewish intellectual having to flee Germany in, in the Second World War. And she witnessed millions upon millions of, of stateless persons across Europe who had no rights because the very countries which were to secure the citizenship rights defined in the International, uh, the Universal Declaration, those states didn't exist anymore. They were stateless persons. And she wanted to make sense of that fact. Uh, rights that were, in her words, supposedly inalienable, proved to be unenforceable, even in countries whose constitutions were based upon them, whenever people appeared who were no longer citizens of any sovereign state. So she laid bare the fact that legally we construct all kinds of exclusions, all kinds of zones of exception where the usual rules of citizenship don't apply because people don't meet the, the criteria of inclusion and belonging. This, this um, tension between international recognition of human, international human rights and the actual framework by, by, by which citizenship claims can be made and acted upon in, in a particular jurisdiction. Um, uh, as I said, is, is evident also as we seek to realize the promise of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, but I was going the wrong way in my paper, so maybe I'll keep going this way. Um, um, for, for a, for, and and for, for a rent, the, the only way to resolve that problem is what she called is for people to have the right to have rights. Uh, that fully belonging to and being equally recognized and valued and respected in the community is, is, an, is the only way to exercise our citizenship rights. And her, 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 her conclusion was to close that gap between inalienable rights and enforcement, we had to have this right to have rights, which is a framing actually that we picked up in the negotiations for the UN Convention around Article 12. We wanted to ensure the capacity to have rights and the capacity to act on those rights. The, the question for Arendt was, well, well, she, well that was her intu intuition. She wasn't so sure that it would be possible to secure this right, to have rights. Wasn't, show, wasn't clear at all about how a framework to ensure that in people's lives, in communities, could, could actually happen. And in fact, it's not actually happening if we take recent public and political discourse in Canada, for example, about refugees and around, and, and I think a discourse that we can see around the world. It's been 70 years since the end of the Second World War, yet with this recent cycle of, of, of uh, a refugee crisis, we're completely inadequate to deal with it. And the de desperate images that we see and hear on a daily basis bear out that, that fact. Uh, as the, and, and, and we see the growing outrage at least from some quarters, about the co collective failure of governments to, to deal with it. At the same time, but I don't think without any, anywhere near the, the scale of public recognition or public discourse, those of us in this room know the hugely dispor disproportionate rates of poverty, unemployment, violence, discrimination, and preventable death that people with intellectual and other disabilities face in this country and around the world. We also encounter daily the legally constructed zones of exception and exclusion that Hannah Arendt first pointed to. As we 
see people with intellectual disabilities live as a matter of course, and living in those zones is a matter of course, whether it's legally mandated and enforced institutionalization, segregated schooling, working for a few dollars a day in a segregated uh, day program or sheltered workshop, or denied the legal capacity to have property, personal care, and health care decisions made. Uh, and have them made through substitute decision-making and guardianship re regimes, or even the citi basic citizenship right to vote. Under the Fair Elections Can Act in Canada, for example, the public guardian, a, a person's court-appointed guardian can request that the uh, chief electoral officer remove from the voting list uh, uh, the name of a person for whom they are guardian. So we're, we're at, the, at the place now, under our Fair Elections Act, where people under court-appointed guardianship, for whom the right to legal capacity has been formally removed, are denied the right to vote, except the chief electoral officer has issued a communication that um, the person under guardianship can still go to the polling booth and request that their name be put back on the list. How that's going to happen if your guardian isn't going to get you there, I'm not entirely. Sure. In all of these ways, people with intellectual disabilities are defined, it, it, it defined as, exclu as excluded, and they're, they're, they're forced into zones which provide for an exception to the very basic rights of citizenship that we thought we had secured in the Universal Declaration and in the, and, and in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But if we understand citizenship as fundamentally about, uh, fundamentally about, uh, about belonging and active participation in and access to the community, what does it mean that we actually live, continue to live with these legally mandated zones of exclusion, enforced legal stateness, statelessness, and other ways of keeping the foreigners out, whether it's because you have an intellectual disability and thereby become foreign in the classroom or the workplace or the schoolyard? or whether you become foreign by virtue of being forced by conflict from your own home or country, living precariously on the margins of communities as migrant labor, low-wage temporary workers to serve others' domestic and commercial needs. French philosopher Etienne Balibar makes this point eloquently as he considers Hannah Arendt's plea for a right to have rights and what that means in the 21st century. He writes, what all this means is that it is the community itself that excludes, not only in the form of bureaucratic rules and procedures, but also in the form of a consensus of its members. It is always citizens, knowing and imagining themselves as such, who exclude from citizenship and who thus produce non-citizens in such a way as to make it possible for them the citizens, to represent their own citizenship to themselves as a common belonging. 